Well, I was just talking about Everett Oleri is a founding member of the Independent Socialist Group serving on its national committee and a four-year package handler at UPS, part of Teamsters Local 170. Evren also serves as the recording secretary of the Futures Committee of Teamsters Local 170, the youth wing of the local. Viva la youth. This coming August 1st, the five-year contract of UPS Teamsters is set to expire. The International Brotherhood of Teamsters elected a new international leadership under Sean O'Brien. We will learn what a strike on this scale entails and why solidarity solidarity is important to all of us. Here is my brother from another mother from two islands, Evan Valerio Valerio. Hello, can uh, everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, nice. So, sorry, this is going to be 20 minutes, um, and then we're only going to be taking two questions, uh, but I will still, you know, try to talk as much as I can, and also, I just forgot to start timing myself. Um, so, yeah, my name is Evan Pajari Soleri. I, you know, I'm not going to actually repeat all of that, but um, I'm kind of speaking on behalf of my union, uh, Team Social Local 170, about something that is incredibly happening right now, uh, which is our new uh, contract negotiations. And, um, you know, when it comes to the development of modern capitalism and stuff like that, the logistics industry has been an incredibly integral part, um, and thus, because of that, has actually put an incredible amount of power concentrated in specific groups of workers. That's delivery drivers, that's package handlers, that's anyone working in, in these warehouses and stuff like that. Um, and therefore, you know, orientating to these workers uh, is incredibly, incredibly important. Uh, the Teamsters Union um, and the contracts that we get, especially at UPS, is a um, industry setting, you know, contract. If we get something really great, other companies like FedEx, USPS, Amazon is going to try to compete with that. Um, and that's the only reason why those may have those jobs and those industries can sometimes have a better perk than us at UPS. Um, and even then, those are very temporary. So, for example, uh, not here in Worcester, but um, you know, in the Midwest, if you work at Amazon, you're actually going to get paid a couple dollars more than you would at a UPS um, package center. And they only raise those wages, you know, a year after uh, UPS up their wages too. So, you know, that's just one example of you know how these things have a cascading effect. So before kind of going into more of that, those broad perspectives, I want to kind of focus on why are UPS Teamsters uh, striking? Because I think, at least in my opinion, it kind of seems that in general, logistics workers don't get a lot of coverage in the media. And there's, especially when it came to the railroad workers, there's this odd thing where it's like, oh, they get paid fine, they get good benefits, so what's their issue, why are they complaining? And UPS is kind of like that too. I mean, I have incredible healthcare. I have the closest thing to universal healthcare you could think of in the United States. It's a broad Teamster uh, healthcare package plan. Everyone pays into it. The company contributes to it. Other things contribute to it. It's a good example, kind of like how Medicaid is and works that way. And um, I have nothing to worry about. And this also applies to my kids. And um, I don't have any kids, but if I had kids, it'd apply to them and a married spouse which I don't, I'm only 24, but um, <laughs> not happening anytime soon. But, um, um, and no, many workers have nowhere close to the levels of protections I have. So for example, one of the things, and this is a good example of how strong a union can be, is um, at my job, I don't even get, um, they can't fire me for attendance, you know? I'd have to get a really long, bad streak of attendance uh, for them to even have that as a disciplinary thing. Uh, safety concerns in my contract, they can't rush me to go faster at all. They can't use the words, you're, even, if, even if it's an implication, I can grieve them and get like 20, 40, 60 bucks from that considering the nature of it. Um, and so, you know, that puts uh, something like that as a great standard for a contract for other workers to adopt. Nonetheless, um, there's still issues that we're facing and if people kind of remember, does anyone remember the 97 UPS strike? You know, when that happened back then, was anyone? That was a year before I was born, so. <laughs> it's very crazy for us. But when it came to that, you know, because of how powerful the union is and how integral, you know, it depends on the direction, even if capitalism continues to exist, the consciousness
business of logistics workers, this is something that uh, the US government and the Democrats and Republicans do put a lot of focus in. So when people remember how powerful that 97 strike was, uh, how great of a contract it was, it was won under reform leadership, Ron Carey, TDU, Teamsters for a Democratic Union, had a lot to play in that. Um, they ended up, they ended up crewing that leadership. So after that strike happened, after the success, and it was so popular, I mean, 74% of Americans supported it. Right after that, the Democrats and uh, UPS went after Ron Kerry. They trumped up very uh, incorrect and wrong charges of money laundering. The Democrats who helped give him money, they fudged the numbers to make it look like their support was actually money laundering. And uh, they ousted Ron Kerry and they expelled him. It's, a pr it's one of the many lessons of the Democrats betraying labor. Um, so every time someone tells me, you know, especially my family, oh, well, you need to vote blue if you're such a, you know, lefty, if you're a socialist, why don't you vote blue? Well, they cooed my union. And so Ron Kerry got expelled. And it also adds to a new definition of like, it be your own. Like, how are you supposed to be four workers and then you're gonna infiltrate and you know, overthrow the leadership of a, a union like the Teamsters? So when they kicked them out, they installed, you know, anyone, well, this, people will know this person, but you know Jimmy Hoffa, the big union guy? Well, his son took over after that. And he ran the union into the ground. I mean, in that period, of, uh, nine, of 2000 to, you know, he just, he didn't run for re-election, so in 2021, he, um, there was the lowest strike action in the history of the Teamsters Union. All across the board, contracts were getting worse and worse and worse, and at UPS, some of the issues that have been dealing with us to the point where it's almost like, it's getting, especially with inflation, it's getting to the point where UPS is no longer being that job, where, you know, they call it the road to middle class. You know, people can take this job, it's very hard to get fired, and then, you know, you, once you get full-time, you get paid like 50, 60K a year. That's kind of one of the reasons why I want to work here and um, why I keep it up for four years. And that's being eroded away. So one of the things that is a big issue at UPS is the wait year for part-timers. So I'm, I've been working here for four years. This is the longest job I've ever had, and I'm not even full-time yet. There's no positions available for me. And that forces me to try to get a second job, and that's very difficult to do. Most of the times I don't even manage that. And so part-timers are dealing with what we in the union have been calling poverty wages, where it's something that you cannot you know, support yourself on. Um, the people before, uh, you had to get full-time in the hub, not delivery truck drivers. We have to wait 10 plus years. You know, who's gonna wait 10 years for full-time? And then your seniority, only starts there when it comes to those benefits. So you could even get a, get this job at 30, wait till you're four, uh, 40 to get full time, retire at 60. You only have a 20 year pension plan. You know uh, they don't count that 10 years you did before. You know other issues that's been uh, happening is um, oh, and then even when you get full time, you have to wait four year period, so your wages fro freezes, and then you get the top rate. Four years, four years of working full time, and you don't get paid a full time rate. You know that's ridiculous. Some of the other issues is um, when it comes to, uh, this is weird, it's Article 67 in the contract, it's the dishonesty clause. And so if they even think you're being dishonest in the technicality of like, say you said one thing and they took it as something else and they have to clarify that, even asking for that clarification, they can say, oh, you're being dishonest, or they can fire you. And then you're out for like a week or two. You're going to get your job back. But there are people, especially big union activists, who go in, go out, get fired like four or five times a year. Oh, just for vague things of dishonesty. For the delivery truck drivers, um, one of the last contracts, and this is part of the, the old Hoffa Junior administration that was so bad, um, the wage tiers, if you see some of the things right over there that we have from the union, no more tiers. All the new delivery drivers since the 2018 contract, that top rate for a delivery driver is like 40, 45 bucks, right? They have these new positions and there's a, I don't have time to make the distinction, but you pretty much fall under a 22.3 or 22.4. It's named after the article. And um, you're at a completely different wage tier that you, you cap out at around like 35 or 36 when you get full time compared to the other drivers who are 40, 45. And you can't refuse overtime, so, once all these other guys, you know, once they hit their eight hours, they can go home. There are delivery drivers now who go in at eight o'clock and don't come home till like 10 or 11, you know? That's crazy. And it makes people want to work somewhere else. Um, and then getting onto that, 
I think it's called a 9.5, I'm not really sure. It really depends on the specific area. But uh, getting into that driving position where you do have you know, all the protections, that's incredibly difficult to get. And you're forced to work a sixth day. If you look at some of the Teamsters propaganda, you know they say no, no force six punch. So they'll force you to work a Saturday. So you're working six days a week at a $10 pay difference. You're forced to work more hours. Nobody's gonna work there. There's a huge drive of, of UPS workers who will rather go to FedEx and Amazon. And even though they get paid less, they get worse hours, they're gonna, um, you know, they'll at least have a life. You know, they're not work, working these crazy hours. So the, and another last thing for, uh, just to highlight some of them, the AC and delivery trucks. Amazon and USPS has AC uh, in their delivery trucks. We don't. And they won't, yeah, they won't implement them. And sadly, and this really hits uh, me hard, especially considering last August, um, one of our brothers in California, Esteban Chavez, he uh, died of heat stroke at the young age of 24, my age, because there was no ACs and they didn't, and he could have actually survived, but the neighbors didn't find him until 10 minutes in. And so he was brought to the hospital, I'm pretty sure, but I think he died in the hospital. It was a very tragic death. That didn't even wake up UPS to implement the ACs. Um, and another thing is when it comes to surveillance, they're implementing surveillance cameras around. And um, I'll be touching on that a little bit later about um, what the union's doing about that. But um, they're already implementing them now. They didn't really care to ask for the union. They're saying they're not gonna use it to uh, harass employees. And it says in our contract they can't bring up recordings like that. But we're dealing it time and time again Brothers and sisters are getting pulled into the office, they're shown a video, and we're just like, well, we can't do anything about that because it's, it's on video, and they're like adamant, adamant pushing it, and um, you know, that's you know, very bad. So, you know, when it comes to uh, all these different issues, um, you know, this is why, and th these were all some of the main issues that um, led Teamsters to eventually oust Hoffa. And that reform movement started really immediately after the coup that happened in the 90s where New York City, Philadelphia, and Kentucky, those locals fell under reform leadership and just kept building and building and building. Um, and so the culminating to what we've seen now. So Sean O'Brien's election to it in a couple years ago was pretty pro uh, positive, you know, despite some of the issues with Sean O'Brien. Uh, Sean O'Brien was a big time Hoffa Jr. ally to the point where in Providence, uh, 251, that local, when they got a reformer in uh, and he was getting you know, up to the election, Sean O'Brien actually, at one of the, the regional Joint Council 10 um, meetings, had threatened to assault this brother and say, I'm gonna punch you if you, you know, and he got uh, banned from the union for a week of that misconduct. And now he's coming around and um, now endorses it. He's made up with this guy and apologized it. He's taken a different turn because that last election where Hoffa Jr. technically won. If anyone knows anything about union elections, usually if you won, that's a comfortable, not a landslide, but a comfortable win. You get like 60, 70 percent. So when Hoffa Jr. got reelected with just 51 percent, that was just, that's what caused the break. That's what caused Sean O'Brien to step aside. That's what caused a lot of these more left-wing aspects of the union bureaucracy to step aside. And uh, the reformers, you know, people on TDU, Teams for a Democratic Union, and other more independent uh, union leaders, and rank and file had organized under Teamsters United. And that would then propel O'Brien. And what is invigorating about O'Brien is that O'Brien's actually willing, win, willing to bring the strike back. And that is such an incredible, important tool for any change is to bring the strike back. Thank you. Um, you know, so I'm also part of the independent socialist group. I, oh no, yeah, he also, that was part of the, the intro too. And so for us as Marxists and revolutionary socialists, we believe uh, first and foremost that through all divisions, even though we definitely fight for, you know, spe uh, against special oppression, against racism, against sexism, we view the, the greatest thing that unifies us is us as workers, our relationship to uh, capitalism, our relationship to society. And this is one of the main issues of the, of the US, uh, like any labor movement, any socialist movement, any you know, anti-oppression movement at all, is that we've lost this kind of class analysis in the sense of either prioritizing class or having that be a significant contributing factor. Um, and that is something that we need to be trying to bring back. And so when someone like Sean O'Brien is talking about 
working class action to solve working class issues that affect all sorts of people, especially the black working class, especially Latin, working class Latinos and immigrants. You know, many of these you know groups fighting, for, especially in the civil rights movement, organized as a class. You know, um, there was a very famous saying from the civil rights movement: "Not all skin folk are kinfolk," and that's something that you know really resonates with um, this union and activity. And so. The difference is, is that, you know, well, that's great, Sean O'Brien's saying this, well, what action has followed through? And that's a pretty good question, and this kind of brings into some concerns. Well, there is a possibility of a strike, there's also a possibility of a really good contract with a very tiny concession. And that kind of happened with the DHL, which is, uh, I forgot what it stands for, but it's, it's a company like UPS, and then uh, the victory of a national contract for Costco. So those are the two major significant contracts that uh, the, the Brotherhood, um, the, the, the IBT had won since O'Brien's election. And DHL's contract, if you look into the details, especially compared to the past, it was really great. I mean, they got wages across all boards, they got back pays in certain specific working conditions, they got a great expansion of healthcare, they got great protections, they actually knocked out their dishonesty clause, I'm, clause, I'm pretty sure, they got good expansion of bereavement, added a pay, but when it was one thing that was the major concession was they actually conceded on the implementation of surveillance cameras. So that's something that we got forced on, that we said we didn't want, that's something O'Brien said we're not gonna let happen, and it happened anyway. Um, and even though there was the concession within that of these are gonna be no audio, no color, and the commitment that we can't use them to be harassing. But the whole problem with that is that they don't even need to bring that up. They just need to catch you doing something multiple, multiple times. And now that they know that you do it, they can just watch you do it and have someone, you know, be on your ass for that shit. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that was a double combo. I, I'm a teamster and I have a potty mouth. I'm just, I try to think so hard about what I'm going to say. My apologies. But, um, <laughs> oh, trust me. <laughs> if you saw me at work. But, um, um, a good thing that grandparents don't have audio. I know. <laughs> That's a great point. There's also strong, uh, I have cussed out many supervisors at my job, so, and all were Ill, uh, well earned. And so, um, what was I even saying? So, but the thing is, then they're gonna start watching, then they're gonna bring it up. All they need to know is that you're doing something that's technically wrong for them to just fire you. And that connects with the whole dishonesty clause thing too. So, um, and that didn't end up in a strike. And the Costco thing, it's a little bit different. It's not as bad because in the finer details, this is actually the first national master contract that Costco workers won. There's 35,000. It included a bunch of whole new workers in it. And that was pretty good. But there were some you know, concessions in there in terms of healthcare payments and, and certain wage increases. And that didn't go on a strike. So it kind of brings into the question of now that we got a reformer in, we need to be critical of all of our leaders all the time. You know what I'm saying? Um, but nonetheless, you know, this invigoration and rejuvenation that's happening in the union um, is an incredibly great opportunity for socialists, for progressives, for, you know, the Green Party here to get involved in that, to build a base and to par participate in that movement of building the labor movement. For us, you know, uh, in the independent socialist group, for socialist teamsters that I work with and coordinate all the time, uh, the working class will and always will be uh, the greatest social force of movement and change. You know, nothing can happen without that. Um, we, the, the, you know, you can look at it how you want. Sure, they have all the guns, they have all the money, uh, but if we stop working, if we withhold our labor and we do it in such an organized fashion, we get to set the tone, we get to make decisions like that, and that's something that we need to be pushing for now. So, yeah, I'm running a little low on time, so I'm gonna skip some points, um, but, you know, when it comes to um, ways that we can, so why, you know, why I asked to speak at this and everything like that and do this workshop, is that um, for any strike to happen, and this is where it comes into, and I'm not gonna go into the video of the whole labor movement, but, you know, um, Sometimes people go on strike not prepared. Sometimes people just throw out strike just to strike, you know. And there's also the conversation about the general strike versus local strikes, and I'm not going to get too much into that. I'm not saying a general strike is bad, though, but, um, you know, there's certain things that you have to do to prepare for it. And that's also kind of comes into the question of why possibly DHL and the cost workers didn't go on strike, because it's not something you just nilly-willy throw out there. Everything needs to be done with a plan. 
and especially with the history of capitalism, capitalism has done an incredibly great job at adapting to the change and adapting to the bending of you know what workers want. Socialism used to be incredibly popular with the working class movement. That's why you have giant communist revolutions all throughout Europe and Africa, Latin America, and the fact that you have capitalist countries that like in India that have socialism enshrined into their constitution, it shows that how willing they are to adapt to the changes. And so this brings into a whole question of that we see in, in popular consciousness. Well, if everything's working out for you, if you have good healthcare, if you have good wages, why do you care about stuff? Because we still have capitalism. You know, we still, that, that's great that our own lives are fine, and that's really great that at the end of the day, especially when I get full time, I'm not gonna have to worry about um, finances and stuff, but I'm still gonna have to worry about, I mean, this is preaching to the choir, but the planet is dying. What are we gonna do with that? So it brings into the political aspect of it too. The Teamsters, you know, have such a huge role in pushing for green, renewable energy, legislation like that, changing how UPS does its own stuff because this building is filthy. And, you know, um, you know, I think there was a presentation about how warehouses contribute to like the, the um, you know, had mentioned how the warehouses contributing to pollution. Um, the working, we Teamsters can, can say that, like, hey, this is happening, in our, this is the materials that you're using, we can't be using that, we need to switch to this. Um, especially the energy that we use to, you know, power the, the delivery truck drivers, the long drive, you know, everything like that. Uh, with the property that UPS has, there's plenty of spaces for solar energy, especially the top building is incredibly flat. Shrewsbury Hub is right on the highway, Jill Stein was talking about that. So, sorry, I'm gonna go a minute over that one, that 20 minute thing, but just to, trouble now. <laughs> so building for it, so this kind of, this is why we're talking to the Greens. So, you know, when it comes to elections and stuff like that, one of the ways that you win an election is if you earn the confidence and you earn the mandate of the working class. And one of the greatest ways to do that is to actually show up and do activity and organizing, have your, whatever it may be. And I know for us and, and Socialist Group, we worked very hard, you know, um, in a lot of different aspects in pushing for Howie Hawkins. I know Jamie over here, we've done so much stuff. She even brought a bunch of greens up for us when one of our members got arrested in the BLM rallies in 2020. And we got those charges dropped, by the way. And, you know, and yeah, when the Greens came out, I mean, driving out from Western Mass, that was crazy. So we definitely, you know, support that and want that. And one of the ways I think this can benefit the Greens and just the working class in general is that for any strike to happen, I know I kind of diverged on this point, uh, for it to win, it needs to be organized coordinated. That needs broad support of uh, the working class. That needs involvement of every section of uh, the working class, every section of, of society. And uh, that's also why General Strikes is an incredibly, incredibly powerful tool. Um, and so for us, you know, ways to build solidarity for this is to please, 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 you look up on social media and stuff like that, any Teamster page you can find, any Teamster figures like Sean O'Brien himself, Fred Zuckerman, uh, Lindsay Do O'Doherty, um, you know, some pretty big Teamsters union uh, leaders, share their stuff, promote their stuff, get involved, talk to the UPS Teamsters you have. If a UPS Teamster uh, delivers your trucks, talk to them about that. We have, I'm gonna bring them, put them on top, but we have all these like car signs that you can put in your cars, that's a great way to show solidarity. Uh, they're sharing, you know, all the media and stuff. Donating to the strike fund, so wherever you are, there's a local, you can just go to their hall and say, I'd like to put some money to your strike fund. There's local strike funds, there's a national strike fund. I don't know how, how you can donate to the na national, but you know, my, in Worcester it's local 170, I don't know what it is in Western Mass, there's 25 out in you know, Boston, there's that. And, it's, and this is the greatest point, I'm gonna end on this point, to you know, save y'all time and, and stuff. Um, really, really important for the Greens to come every day of the strike, whatever picket's closer to you, whatever's a big thing, show up in contingents and wear your stuff, wear your shirts, have that support and whatever you can do. Um, and, that, and get into those conversations, you know, when you're talking to working class people, you don't wanna make it about you, but it is kinda, you wanna build the Green Party because you, you wanna be confident and say, well, the Green Party is a much more legitimate person and organization to vote for than the Democrats. But just building that solidarity, people to be visible for you. I know in, in my hub, I mean, we all talk shit about the Democrats and Republicans all the time. And there's a lot of conservatives there. We try to talk, as a socialist, you know, I try to talk to my conservative brothers, even if I don't like them, and I still have to defend them in union meetings, even if I don't think they should work there, but, um, <laughs> you know, principles of a unionist. Yeah. So, you know, that's incredibly important.
weren't. So I really hope August 1st is when it expires. We most likely are going on, on strike. So I know um, the workers strike back, their speaker, Alicia, mentioned if, and that's it's still a strong if, but it's looking more and more likely that we will. So I really implore the Greens to discuss this amongst yourselves, talk about it to you, if you know anyone in other states, but really make those, um, you know, uh, th those picket lines, those dele green delegations, and I'm sure it's going to change a lot of things in the, in the union. We'll so that's it. Yeah, I know you are. Yeah. Uh, no, so it's a national contract. So all 350,000 UPS workers will be going on strike. That will be one of the biggest and largest strike actions ever in the entire history of the United States. biggest strike in the last 20 years. I think it's like fifth or sixth, historically speaking. So, um, no, it, it's going to be huge, all 350,000. So, thank okay. you. We have time for one more question, and he's got to get his hand up. Thank you. It's a democratic process. We're coming. Um, so this is sort of a two-part question. Um, so you did mention a little history with the Teamster unions. Uh, there was a huge decline under Hoffa's Jr. Um, I know under Hoffa Senior, even though he was a controversial figure, uh, the Teamsters loved him, and he was, you know, huge. You know, they were sort of at the peak of their popularity and, and uh, size under under Senior. So I'm just curious, um, in recent years, in your experience, has the Teamster unions regained <laughs> some of their lost uh, numbers and influence? Uh, and you're, you're seeing a growing trend in that direction, or, or yeah, just curious what. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Jimmy Hoffa is a very big figure. And so one, one of the people I had actually mentioned, Lindsay O'Doherty, she kind of represents, she's the vice president. She's, a, you know, so if you, you saw the work, the WGA uh, Writers Guild of America go on strike, you know, that uh, Teamsters have a lot of people in, uh, in that adjacent to it. And she's been on the ground there. She styles herself as a, what she calls a hot fight, I think, or something like that. Or, you know, bringing back uh, Hoffa's legacy. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of popularity there, but there was the issue to understand why Hoffa came about was, um, you know, communists used to be incredibly involved in the Teamsters Union. People don't know that the, the uh, 1934 Teamster General Strike uh, in Minneapolis, where pretty much the Teamsters and the working class, they essentially took control over the city and they administered it on and off for months. Uh, the government denounced it as a Soviet uh, coup, and it was actually run by Trotskyists in the SWP. And um, the Hoffa only came about because many of those communist elements were imme were purged in the 40s and 50s. They were arrested, they were you know stripped of their positions. Um, and Hoffa came about through populist messaging, so almost like a Trump kind of figure, a Sanders figure. And um, well, we want to you know yeah, he did a lot of stuff. But there's a lot of political concern when it comes to that because a lot of that was very uh, aggressive individualistic actions. And when the working class takes actions that can be seen as an attack on the capitalists, it needs to be unified and coordinated. It can't be bullying, it can't be backhand negotiations. And that's kind of what Hoffa did was he, uh, it was a lot of gangster activity. And um, in the 80s and 90s, I mean, that, that as much as, okay, sure, that one short terms, but that is huge, huge ways for the government to just put them under federal control. Yeah. And TDU, if people remember that, Diana Kilmer, she was a big TDU leader, she's retired now, but she led an effort of many to kind of get rid of those and avoid the government takeover. So yeah, he is popular, there's a lot of concerns at the end of the day, we don't really want to go back to those those Harvard junior, or senior years. Yeah. Um, because of the target that it put, and look at him, he, he pretty much got killed. Like, I know nobody found his body or anything, yeah. but no, he got, like, uh, yeah, and I don't think that was from the government, I think it was from the gangs. Uh, so, I guess the, the second part is the growth, yeah. So, um, yeah, since O'Brien got elected in, there's been massive unionization.
organization campaigns, and it used to be 1.3 million, the union now is uh, reporting 1.5 million. So that's about 200,000 more workers. A lot of that had to do with the Costco agreement. Lots of more regional stuff are expanding. I know Clark University grad students joined us. That's just a small amount. But in terms of, um, like, I know before, during the Hoppe years, you know, I wouldn't really be able to be involved in much of the local stuff, but they, you know, are involving so much more rank and file. They're bringing back some stuff they did before where rank and file can be on the negotiating committees now, and that is an incredibly important thing. Uh, even though I'm an explicit socialist and the union bureaucrats are all liberals, they keep in involving me in stuff and keep willing to build up this more working class thing rather than the subservience to the, to the bosses, the capitalists, and the state. So overall, I mean, it, it's going in the right direction. And the, and, 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 and,